grateful. And um, we're just really blessed with um, what God is doing. And um, I just wanted to recap a little bit about um, yesterday for those who weren't here. Um, we were talking about dealing with disappointment. And um, I just um, I just want to give opportunity, actually, for anyone from last night um, to give um, a testimony. If God spoke to you um, or healed you, I think there was a couple instances where we had some healings. I'm not sure. Um, we've got sort of a bit of a new crowd here, but there might be a few people that might want to share. I'm going to pick on Jim. Would you come up and share um, what you had told us after the meeting? Um, uh, we had an opportunity to uh, to just lay what was uh, we were dealing with before the Lord. You know, um, issues of disappointment or um, any unforgiveness. So. Um, I had, I, I discovered in that time, you know, because I, you know, I thought, I'm, I'm walking in forgiveness, but there was, yet there was something that was bugging me, and I wasn't really aware of it until I just went before the Lord and said, okay, Lord, so is there anything? So then he just revealed, you know, there's some little thing creeping up, it was sort of sneaking up on me. So I just laid it before him, and then he said, okay, so ask the Holy Spirit if there's anything you're going to get in response for this out and I got honeycomb so I thought that was pretty good so I looked up honeycomb and uh, there, Jonathan I don't know if there's a story of Jonathan uh, Saul was actually out for revenge on his enemies and he commanded a fast but Jonathan didn't know about it he, they found honey and he just went and ate some honey and he says uh, his eyes were enlightened so, that's, good. <laughs> that's, good. that's really good. Um, I think that speaks to us about how when we lay things down, the Lord wants to open up our eyes. He wants to brighten our viewpoint. So, um, thank you very much, Jim, for sharing. Anyone else? Have anything from last night that they'd like to share? Go with once. Go with twice. Okay. Um, we felt like we operated in a new release in the prophetic last night, so we were we were really encouraged with that. And um, just for you who, who weren't there, we had a real struggle to get our message together for last night. And um, we turned this way and that way. I think we wrestled for about um, oh, 12 hours, maybe. And the 10th hour, the 11th hour, it was pretty obvious the Lord didn't want to fit into our framework. But as I shared last night, Bonnie had given us a word that the Lord had said that it was a wrap. So we even tried, Bonnie, to try to use wrap as our point, <laughs> W-R-A-P or R-A-P, and that didn't seem to work either. But the Lord um, spoke and said that he wants to wrap it all up in hope. So our disappointment, the answer to disappointment is hope. And so that's what we were um, feeling like the Lord was instilling in us yesterday, last night. The other thing that I want to share about yesterday is in that time when the Lord was sort of reorchestrating what we were sharing, um, or putting our message together, um, we had a worship time, and then this um, prophetic song came. And the, and the song was, the words were, I just want to speak it again, and I want to make sure that I got it right. Yeah. And there was more to it, but... We didn't record it, so I don't really remember all of it, but this is, the, this is the main point of it. He said, it's a simple word. I am who I am. I am who I say I am. Lift your eyes above the storm. I am who I say I am. And he does what he'll say. He does what he says he'll do. So um, I just wanted to 
reinforce that tonight, that we're going to start off with that. And then while we were sitting here tonight, I'm just going to say this now, it could maybe fit in later, but I might forget later. So um, as Mark was speaking, and it's no relation to Mark necessarily, but maybe, I don't know, the word came into my mind, supernatural weight loss. And I was like, Lord, like what, what, what do you mean? And I really felt like he was saying he wants to give us supernatural weight loss. And then he spoke more about it and he says he wants all the weights to come off. And so I want us to decree that tonight. The Lord is saying he wants the weights to come off of us. Just a, a note with that, it, uh, it's interesting that Angie brings that up. Uh, if you were here last week, Cheryl Fritz was here uh, from Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, she has a training school called Inside Out Training and Equipping School, and they hold all, all these different uh, online seminars via Skype, and uh, I, I joined up with her group on Facebook, so I've been getting these updates, and I think it's tomorrow night, they are doing a seminar uh, on Inside Out through the, one of their trainers is teaching on supernatural weight loss. Uh, so if you're interested in that, and it talked about, um, talked to actually, <laughs> are you losing your hair and you don't know what to do? I thought, well, maybe I, I could go to that one. But, um, <laughs> uh, but there was a few different things that had to do with our physical bodies that, you know, often we just think, oh, well, that's just the way it is. But they're, uh, they're holding a training seminar on how to deal with some, some of this stuff. So if you're at all interested, just check her out on uh, her website, Inside Out Training and Equipping School, or go on Facebook and, and you can find out some more information. It, it was really interesting, uh, some of the stuff that she taught about. So. We are really thankful for the opportunity to um, have these two evenings to minister. Um, our involvement at the Christian Link here has been um, very instrumental in the Lord um, reviving us, um, resurrecting us, <laughs> and um, and we're just really grateful. And the Lord's put on our heart, and put on my heart about five years ago uh, to start a ministry called Arise Now. And it feels like it's time now. It's time to arise now. And um, in the next few weeks, we will be having a website, arisenow.ca, uh, up and running. So you can check us out, but don't check us out now because it'll say it's under construction. <laughs> And isn't that a picture of what the Lord does with us? We are all under construction, and um, and He's building something beautiful in each one of us. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna. I want to start off tonight by just sharing uh, sort of uh, from an experience that I was having yesterday afternoon, and uh, we we kind of came to the place yesterday in the preparation for all this to. Uh, just say, well, Lord, we're, we're going with the flow and we're not going to have it all ordered just the way we would like. And, and so I went and uh, laid down on the couch and uh, turned on the TV, um, watching, I had recorded a hockey game, I caught up a bit on that. And then uh, I like to watch uh, a show on TV called The Voice. I don't know if any of you yes. have ever watched that show or have heard of it. And, uh, and so I had recorded last week's shows and hadn't watched them yet. And I really like watching them in the recorded version because I can skip a whole bunch of stuff and I just get to see the, the performances. But uh, what, what happens in me when I watch that show, and I think the reason why I really like it is because when, uh, when somebody is living out or trying to live out their dream and the gift that God has put within them is, is being put out there, there's something in me that just connects with that. And so yesterday, uh, I'm watching this show, and, and there's some things happening on the show that are just causing me to weep. And I'm going to share two examples because I, I really think that what, uh, what was rising up in me and what was really connecting with my spirit in what was happening in this show is a picture of what God is doing and wants to continue doing in an increasing way within the body of Christ. So if you're not familiar with the show, they bring a singer out on stage and there's four superstar coaches, they call them. They're all professional, uh, full-time uh, singers. 
And they are sitting in chairs, and they're facing, like the stage is there, and they're facing this way. And then the person starts to sing, and if they really just hear, it's all about the voice, right? They can't see what the person looks like or what they're doing on stage. And if they really like them, they hit their button and they, the chair turns around. I want to interrupt for a minute. I would turn my chair for you, Mandy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was awesome. I would too. You'd have a two chair turn for sure. Probably about a 40 chair turn. That was, your voice is just amazing. I could just sit and listen to it all day long. It's just, and again, it's just seeing the gift of God being used, and it yeah. just is, is beautiful to see when God has given someone a talent and and, a, and truly a gift, and they're using it for His glory. So, so bless you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. <laughs> so, so anyway, this um, this girl, young girl, she's in her in her teens. I don't know. She's 16, 17 years old. She comes out and and she sings really well, but sometimes they don't get any chairs to turn. And, and they play, as soon as the song's done and no chairs have turned, they kind of play this kind of sad music. <laughs> and your heart just kind of goes, oh. So, so she's standing up there, and it's just this really tough, difficult moment. But the coaches turn around then, and they start asking her and, and giving her a bit of uh, feedback. And, and um, one of the coaches' names is uh, Pharrell Williams, who sings a song called Happy. You know, um, if you're like a room without a roof or something like that. I, I, I don't know. I don't know all the words that one. Clap along if you feel. <laughs> anyway, it's a really kind of upbeat, happy song. And, and uh, she says, um, she says, you know, I, I actually practiced that song and I was thinking of doing it. And then Pharrell's sitting there. The guy who sings it says to her, well, just go ahead and sing it. And uh, Christina Aguilera sitting beside him says, Pharrell, you go up and sing it with her. So he goes up, and the band gets going, and Pharrell starts, and then he's over to her, and they're going back and forth, and here she is. She was rejected, like, because her no chairs had turned around, and all of a sudden, she has been put in this moment where she is singing the song that she wanted to sing with the guy who professionally recorded it. And there's something in that moment. It's just like, oh, this is, this is so beautiful. And it was just so touching. And then the one other moment that connects with this, there was a, a, another young fellow on the show, and he was really good. He got all four chairs to turn around. And he was a country singer, and, uh, and it was just, it was, it was really like one of those that was just like, wow. And they're all, they're all saying all this feedback to him, and then Blake Shelton says to him, you have a gift that no one else has in country music, and all you need is someone to go and introduce you to Nashville. And people, that's what is happening in the body of Christ. No longer is the day where we have these superstar people who are just walking around doing their thing and not imparting it to other people. Amen. Our experience as God, like we we described some of our journey last night about this resurrection that's been happening in us, in particular in me, in the last few months. And if you weren't here last night, you will be able to access, um, I think the video is on YouTube, it has to just be adjusted a bit yet before it'll be public. But uh, within the next day or two, if you go on there, the link will be on the Christian link, or you can just type in Paul and Angie Wagler on YouTube and you'll be able to, to find it. And you can hear more of the story of what we shared last night. But our journey and what we're experiencing is there's people coming alongside of us who's, who are saying, we see something in you and we want to work with you. We want to help launch you. We want to introduce you to Nashville. <laughs> and what God's putting in our hearts is we want to, as, as we're being raised up, we want to do the same to other people. See, there's something, there's a gift of God in you, and how can we help launch that, launch you into what God has called you to do? A couple of weeks ago when Darren Canning was here, for some reason, I guess it's the Lord, he just took a particular fondness to Angie and I. 
And he's like, I'll give you my cell number. You can call me anytime. You guys should come on a ministry trip with me. I'll introduce you to some wild people. <laughs> I'll introduce you to Nashville. <laughs> I don't think he's taking us to Nashville. But, but it's the same idea. And there's something in that that just was gripping my heart. I thought, this is what God wants to do in the body. It's what Mark preaches every week. And Elizabeth, it's about all of us being raised up to do our thing. So anyway, God touches and speaks to you in unusual ways. It can come anytime. Uh, while you're watching TV, while you're walking around with your dog, or I mean, anytime. God uh, doesn't have any limits as to when he can speak. And so tonight, we're going to build on what we talked about last night. Last night, we talked about dealing with disappointment. And tonight we're going to talk about uh, dropping indecision. Last night's theme was more focused on the past, dealing with disappointment, having peace with, or making peace with the past would be another way to put it. Tonight we're going to talk about dropping indecision or prospering in the present. This is part of a, of a larger uh, uh, framework that Angie and I are working on that we hope to uh, sometime in the next few weeks, months, we're not quite sure the time frame, I actually put some of this into written form. And uh, the overarching theme is, is living life in 3D. Now what do I mean by living life in 3D? Well, if you are living life in 2D, in two-dimensional, you are just full of concepts and ideas, but it is not coming to a full reality. And what God wants to do in our lives is he wants to take the concepts and the ideas, the dreams and the visions that are just there in us, that haven't yet come out, they're in a two-dimensional form, and he wants to raise them up so they become a full reality and they're experienced in 3D. 3D is the full reality. You know, sometimes you're reading scripture and, uh, and, you know, if the Spirit isn't really breathing life into it for you at that time, or if you're not open to, to Him speaking to you, it's just like a two-dimensional book. How many times have you read Scripture and all of a sudden it's like something left off the page and hit you in the face? It's just gone from 2D to 3D. We want to live life in 3D. And so tonight, we want to talk about dealing with, or sorry, dropping indecision, prospering in the present. This particular theme is probably uh, one of the things that I am most passionate about. I, uh, uh, in my, my daily work as a bus driver, and, and it's probably the same in, 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 in a lot of your uh, interactions with people through the week. People look forward to one day each week, and it's Friday. <laughs> I remember this guy used to get on my bus on Monday morning, and I would say, hey, how are you today? He'd say, oh, only four more days till Friday. I'm like, really? Like, we just started the week, and all you're doing is thinking about Friday? And then we've, uh, we've developed this other uh, day week through the week that kind of helps get us through the week to Friday. And it's Wednesday and it's called Hump Day. We're making camels popular now. <laughs> and so somehow in the mindset that goes with TGIF, thank God it's Friday, is that we miss what God wants to do today. It's T-G-I-T. Thank God it's today. In John chapter 10, there's a verse that uh, probably some of you are familiar with. I think it's John 10, verse 10. And it says, Jesus is, is talking about the, the shepherd and the sheep. And then he's, he's, he says, The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. So I want to suggest to you, for you to consider, 
I think one of the greatest ways that the enemy steals from us as human beings, as Christians, is that he steals our today. Because if you are not living fully present in today, you are missing out. You are missing out on today's blessing. Yesterday is gone and tomorrow may never come. I think that's in the song, isn't it? <laughs> what do you have? You have today. Today is the day God wants to bless you. We, we were, yesterday we were trying to deal with the past. Just the one particular area is dealing with disappointment. There's lots of other things we could focus on, but... But we want to just let the past go and be behind us. And we want to live fully present in today. And with regards to the future, we want to. We were talking last night about getting a revelation of hope. What is hope? Hope is for the future. But it is not meant for us just to live in anticipation of that. It's meant to make an actual difference in how we live today. Hebrews 4 verse 7 says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. It's not yesterday. It's not tomorrow. It's today. God is speaking to us today. Interesting verse. When I was pondering this, that I discovered in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. It says this, As co-workers with God, we urge you not to forfeit the grace that is that you have received. Remember that. He's saying not to forfeit the grace that you have received. Then he says that in the time of God's favor, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. And then Paul declares to them, but I say to you, now is the time of God's favor, and now is the day of salvation. When is now? Like, we don't need a, a, a great Greek understanding to get this. When is now? Now. Now, now. Like, right now. Today. And the whole idea that it says in verse 1 about forfeiting the grace that we have received, I want to suggest to us that I think that happens when we don't live in today. If we are living in the past, or living in the future, we're missing out on what God wants to do today. And my passion is for people, yes, there are times we look forward to Friday, but man, I want to enjoy Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday on the journey there. Because God's got so much He wants to do and impart to us today. Today. All right. <laughs> well, part of that is we're going to talk transition and talk a little bit about purpose. God has a purpose for us, and it really is linked to our inheritance. Jeremiah twenty nine eleven says, "For I know the plans I have for you." declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, give you a hope and a future. Ephesians 1, 18 and 19 talks about our glorious inheritance. Do you have that one? Yes. Um, Why don't you say it? What's that? Can you say it? Yes. Uh, oh. This has got to go to that spot on the hard drive. <laughs> um, I could look I it pray up. also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which she has called you the riches of the glorious inheritance of the saints and the incomparably great power for us who believe. Thank you. So in our purpose, God wants to, like I said, it's linked to inheritance. So let's think back to the children of Israel. Where were they? They were in Egypt. They were in slavery. And God sent a deliverer, Moses, and brought them out. There was a wilderness process. But eventually they got to the promised land, and that was their inheritance. That was their promise from God. And he had a purpose for them. He had a land for them to live in. He, he had um, um, yeah, purpose. Purpose for them. 
And when we were talking about some of this to, you know, the question that came to mind was, what wars against the purpose of God in our life? Who is he calling us to be? And there's a lot of things that could war against it, but we're going to um, narrow in on one, and it's double-mindedness. James 1, 6-8 tells us about the double-minded man who's unstable in all his ways. As I ponder the whole idea of double-mindedness, if we're indecisive, it's something that we want to drop. But there's, there's so, um, as I observe my life and, and lives of many Christians around me, I think there's, there's a, a lot of double-mindedness within the church. It's that we say we believe one thing, but our lives, the way we live it out, would say something totally different. I remember a number of years ago, I read a book uh, on um, umbilical worldviews by, I think it was Timothy Warner, and uh, he said there's, there's, there's two kinds of worldviews happening in the church. The one is the one that we say we ascribe to, when we say this is what we believe, sort of like uh, our, you know, our doctrinal statements and and we say this is this is uh, how we believe about what we believe about God and about Jesus and about the Holy Spirit and all that. But he said then there is the the level a, a whole another level of worldview which is actually what you really believe because it's what you live out day to day. And what God is wanting to do in this hour is He's wanting to bring the two of those together, where there's this congruency within us in how we live. Is, is, is congruent with what we say we believe. So if we declare, we believe God is all-powerful and that He can heal and He, he can um, uh, deliver and, and He can save, then it should affect the way that we live our daily lives. And there should be a great difference between how we approach problems and situations compared to how our neighbors approach them who don't know the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We want to drop that indecision. We want to know what our purpose is and we want to live it out. A number of years ago, I had a dream had several dreams, quite a few dreams, but this was back, oh, I don't know. I don't know if it was shortly after we um, had... Probably almost 10 years ago. Yeah, probably 10 years ago. It was after we left ministry. And um, so in this dream, some people came to the door um, to visit and uh, knocked on the door, and I opened the door. And so I went down to the basement where Paul was, to tell him that we had company. And, and when I got down there, um, he was in a box, as well as about another two people, I'm not sure who they were, but there was, um, I think, about three boxes there, and he was in this box, kind of cardboard box, kind of. And so I went down and I said, um, so-and-so is here, would you like to come out of your box? And he said, no, I like it in my box. So he's going to share a little bit about being in the box. <laughs> Angie told me this dream and, and told some others who we were um, relating more with at that time. And it was all pretty, it was pretty clear to all of us that this dream was actual fact. I was in a box. And I really did like it in the box. It was safe. It was comfortable. We had, uh, as we shared last night, had been in ministry, stepped out in 2001 from that, and, and kind of gone into this uh, kind of wilderness place. And because of uh, probably some hardness in my heart, I was, I, I, I was good in my box. 
So when Angie shared how the in the dream she knocked on it and asked me, do you want to come out? And I said, no. I was like, yeah, I can. That's right. That's the way I feel. I knew conceptually that it would probably be the right thing to do would be to get out of the box. But I didn't really want to get out of the box. We had some times of prayer together with some others. Uh, Don and Sharon were part of that. There were times of praying for me to get out of my box. And probably there was times I maybe partially got out. And... But the full getting out of the box didn't happen until six months ago. If you want to know what happened there, you got to watch the video from last night because I'm not going to tell the whole story again tonight. But it's the word of the Lord. One, one word from God can change your life. Amen. One word from God blew up my box. <laughs> <coughs> and, and I'm out of it now. But in the box is a place of indecision. As a Christian, I would say things different than, than what I was actually living out inside my box. Still following the Lord, still doing some preaching and, and different things, but really uh, I wasn't free. And one word from the Lord changed all that. And it connects with getting a sense of my purpose. When you get a revelation of what God's purpose is in your life. It blows everything away changes things. So knowing your purpose is the first part of really prospering in the present, dealing with the indecision. The second thing we want to talk about tonight is peace and experiencing the peace that God wants to give us. And the verse that connects with this is one of my most favorite verses in scripture. Colossians 3.15 Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Peace is the level of peace in which you and I function and experience in our lives is directly related to the level of which we function in thanksgiving. If you're having trouble with peace, Start giving thanks. Start giving thanks. And you know, sometimes we, we go through life and there's, there's things from our past that kind of cause us to not be able to live in peace. And I'm just going to share with you two quick stories. We'll try to make them quick. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to be one who says, to make a long story short, because I generally find when people say that, what they're doing is actually making the story longer. <laughs> so, but there, there's times in our life where we don't have peace, and we need to have some discernment as to what's going on. And sometimes the Holy Spirit is prompting something uh, that's disturbing the peace in your soul. Because there's something you have to do to make something right from your past. And there was a, a time, probably 25, 27, 8 years ago, this was quite a while ago, uh, we were on a bit of a road trip with another couple. And uh, something happened while we were driving that was just really nothing, but I made it something internally. And I got really kind of like, just like... Bent out of shape. Bent out of shape. That's a good thing. Thank you. Over what was really nothing. And I wasn't fun to be around, and I just wasn't, I just was miserable inside because of what had happened here. As I didn't get my way, basically. And the day went on, and the trip went on, and then I kind of got over it, and life went on. Well, two or three years later, this event keeps coming back to my mind. It's like, ah, oh, so I just ignore it. But the Spirit, the Holy Spirit just keeps bringing it up. So finally I'm like, you know what? I just want to be free. I want my peace back. So I go to this brother, and I, I, I said, you remember on that trip? And no, 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 no. He sort of vaguely remembered. I said, you know, I just really 
got bent over shape over that. And I, was, I was just wrong. I was wrong. And I want you to forgive me. He, he didn't even remember any of it. But that wasn't the important part. The important part was I confessed it and asked for forgiveness, and I was free. I had my peace back. <laughs> Another story. Uh, I was a truck driver for a number of years, and uh, when I started my truck driving career with air transport, I didn't have the best start. Within the first several months, there was, uh, let's just say that overhangs of buildings were not my friends. <laughs> I was on delivery, so you know, I was having to pull into restaurants and stores in tight spots, and there was within probably the first six or seven months, I hit three overhangs on buildings. <laughs> and I could tell you exactly where each one of those are today. Because <laughs> I remember. <laughs> Hopefully they're fixed by now. Yeah. And then shortly after that, uh, also within the first year, I was driving, it was uh, December 22nd, I think, 1987, I was driving one of the... 21st. 21st, thank you. And uh, <laughs> not that, that really matters, but anyway. I was driving one of the uh, uh, newer trucks, it was only a few months old, and I was going up a road, and I went into the ditch and I laid it on its side. And uh, it wasn't, there was some damage, it, was, it wasn't horrible, but it, it was still, I had this, this accident. And I mean, I was just like, I was devastated. I remember, this was the days, I was telling one of our kids about this the other day. And you know, the, the modern, the younger generation today doesn't have a concept of what life used to be like before we had cell phones. So I said, you know, I put this truck in the ditch. I had to walk, I was out in the country, I had to walk to the closest farmhouse so that I could call my company and, they, and make touch with people. And they're like, really? You had to walk up to a stranger's house? I'm like, yeah, that's how we did things back then. It's not even that long ago. But, uh, not that long ago. Tell you, oh, I just want to, because part of this story really connects with last night, and we talked about disappointment. When I got home, Angie didn't know what had all gone on because I didn't have a phone to text her and say, hey, you know, I've had a bad day or whatever. And I got home, and she wasn't home. She was over at my sister's place, and I called her, and I'm telling her what happened, and I just started weeping on the phone. And it's just like the disappointment in myself. You know, we want to we want to be able to move past those things. So that was, that was, what we were working at last night. So I was called in to the office and uh, they said to me, you know, you've had a few different things here and uh, stats show that if you, you know, the people have a bunch of things like this, they're going to have a big one. And so if you have any more incidents, we're going to have, because I had worked first for this company loading trucks and then I went on the road driving. They said, if you have any more incidents, you're going to have to go back to loading truck. And I was like, oh man, how am I going to? And it was just, gave me really good advice. He's like, just take one day at a time. Break it down even smaller. Take one hour at a time. So I, I began to do that. I began to focus on, on how can I be drive safely for the next hour. <laughs> and then the next hour after that. And then soon the days started to, to add up into months, and to, or to weeks and months and years. And I soon was uh, driving safe for, for quite a few years. And so it was probably, uh, I don't remember the exact amount, but it was probably like seven or eight years later. I'm uh, delivering in London, Ontario, and I'm driving uh, into an alleyway to make a delivery to a bakery. And as I turn to drive into this alleyway, uh, my rear wheel of my truck just nicks the bumper of a, of a car that's parked in front of this bakery, which happened to be the person who's working in the bakery. Immediately, my mind goes to, oh no. He said, you know, several years ago, if anything else happens, you're going to have to go back to loading. Probably wasn't the case anymore because I had had quite a few years of safe driving. So in the midst of that, I made a decision. I'm just going to deal with this on my own. So I made a plan 
with the person whose car it was. I said, you have to promise me you're not going to report me. Uh, this seemed like a good idea at the time, trust me. <laughs> and I gave her my number, and, and she went out and got a, an estimate on what it would cost to fix her car, and, and I ended up giving her cash, and it all got taken care of, and she never reported me. And at the end of the year, we got these safe driving pins, and it would have the number of years that you'd built up, and you'd get a bonus, too some dollars, some X amount of dollars. And you were invited to a banquet to celebrate. Now it was really wonderful and convenient because that particular year we had a conflict the night of the banquet and so we couldn't go and I thought, oh, that's really good, I didn't really want to go anyway. <laughs> and I thought this was okay and I just kind of let it be. But every once in a while the Holy Spirit would bring this up. And it would rob me of my peace in the present. <laughs> Something from the past coming into the present and robbing my peace. And I kind of worked through it, justified it in my head, and kind of leave it. And it just kind of kept going. I don't even remember the time frame of how long it took me to work through this, but finally it came to the point where I was talking with Angel. I was just like, I gotta, I gotta clear my conscience on this one. I gotta go to them and tell them what happened. So I said to the Lord, if, if, when I got back from my work that day, if, if he's there, the guy I need to talk to, I'll go. And his car was going to go. <laughs> and, and so I went and just confessed everything. And it felt so good. What it cost me. I paid to get that bumper fixed out of my own pocket. When I confessed it, they took my safe driving bonus back. I didn't care. Because now I was free. I got my peace back. And sometimes there's things that we have done in the past where we can't just say, God forgive me. We actually need to go to a brother or a sister or an employer or somebody. And we need to make some restitution. We need to ask for forgiveness. It's when we do that in those moments that we can truly once again prosper in the present. We're, we're dealing with that stuff and we can receive the peace that God wants to give us. I just want to say on that one too, we, we, um, we know the story of Zacchaeus and I'll just say a little bit in case you don't know the story of Zacchaeus. He was, a, he was a tax collector, and in Jesus' day, they would take more money than what they were supposed to take from the people. And Jesus was coming to town, and Zacchaeus really wanted to see him, and he was a man of small stature, so he climbs a tree so that he can see Jesus. And um, when Jesus sees him, he says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to come to your house. And, and Jesus did go to his house. And Zacchaeus was so impacted by Jesus, Jesus didn't talk to him about um, what he was doing, but he was so impacted by the presence of Jesus that he said, you know what, this day I'm going to give back to everyone that I've wronged four times the amount that I took. When we meet Jesus, there's something that changes in our hearts. I just wanted to yeah, inject good. that. A biblical example of what I was talking about. The next thing we want to just uh, focus on for a little bit is, is that helps us to drop in decision and prosper in the presence. Present is, is the presence of God. You know, there's a, a verse in Psalms 16, or sorry, 16, 11, that says, You will make known to me the path of life. Your presence is fullness of joy. Is that not what we desire every day, is fullness of joy? You know, in 1 um, uh, Peter 1.8, it says, You have seen, uh, that was the first part of the verse, so it's not coming to me, but the end part of the verse is that you are filled with the inexpressible and glorious joy, or some translations say joy unspeakable and full of glory. 
Joy unspeakable. Joy that is inexpressible. Isn't that awesome? It's joy so good we can't even speak about it. And where does it come from? It comes from the presence of the Lord. So it's learning to live in the presence every day. Being filled with joy. I just, I am so, just, like, I love it that we are blessed with these wonderful things. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Inexpressible. The piece we were just talking about in uh, Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7, it talks about that you do some things, uh, giving uh, things over to the Lord, and you're going to be filled with a peace that passes understanding. It's something you can't even co comprehend, so don't try to, but just receive it. Peace that passes understanding, joy that's inexpressible. These are the gifts that God wants to give us. What a good and wonderful Father we have. What does joy look like? Just think about it. You know, sometimes we read stuff or we hear stuff, but get a picture of what does joy really look like. And um, there's been times in my life where I'm more on the depressed end, or have been, and, um, and I don't laugh near as much. But when I am happy and I do laugh, I have a real cackle that I get made fun of. I have a nephew who can actually imitate me quite well, and um, and um, and my kids sometimes. Like if I, you know, if I really get going, they're like, "Oh, she's crazy again." And um, well, and, then, and maybe there's some truth to that. But I tell them that we all need at least five minutes of belly laughter a day. So. I encourage you, think what joy looks like. Envision what joy looks like. There's a scripture, and I think it's in Luke, where it says that Jesus was full of joy. You know, it's like, what did that look like? You know, let's not just let some of that just go over our heads. Let's, let's meditate a little bit on that. What does it look like? Well, when I think of the presence of God, when I was thinking about that, I thought, you know, the phrase bread of his presence came to mind. And um, I don't know how many weeks ago it was, um, over a month ago maybe, five weeks ago, I had a, 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 a vision, an image during worship here of um, bread. The, I thought it was snow, but it was, it was bread, the bread of his presence. Um, and I, I have to think about the Old Testament where the Lord provided daily bread for the people. Manna came every day. And we need to have, we need to have that daily relationship with Jesus, that nourishment every day. That's, that's really, uh, I heard somebody say once, um, in the natural, if you don't eat, you starve. We have a, a physical hunger that would, um, where we notice it. But if we don't eat in the spirit, it kind of goes the, different, the, the other way. We, we can starve and not realize we're starving. And so you have to actually keep eating to get hungrier. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They will be filled. You need to hunger and thirst to be filled. And, um, and you need to recognize it. So I just want to encourage you. Like, let's keep that, those connections open with the Lord. Um, I was reading back in some of my journals. And, you know, sometimes the Lord tells us things that we kind of forget or we practice for a while and then... You know, life comes and we kind of forget about them or whatever. But there was um, one day the Lord said to me three times in, in when he was talking to me. And I generally, when, he, when that kind of happens, I write it down. And it's always really good. Um, and when I go back and read it again, I thought, oh, that was really good. You know? But yeah. somehow, it, isn't, it, always, it doesn't always stick with me. But the three things that he said to me that day was, 
I want you just to breathe in my goodness. Breathe in my goodness. He's good. Breathe it in. So what I thought, okay, well, what I'm just going to do is I'm going to breathe it in. So it's like, Father, I'm breathing in your goodness. Big breath. And you know, when I would do that, like when I would be troubled about something or whatever, I just laid out on the couch and I'd say, I'm just breathing in your goodness. And I'd take some deep breaths and I, it, it would all dissipate. So I'm, I'm going to just lead you through that. So if you want, you can have your eyes open, but if you want to close your eyes, I just encourage you to focus on him. And um, Father, we're just breathing in your goodness. Breathe it in. Father, I am breathing in your goodness. I am breathing in your goodness. I don't know about you, but I am feeling pretty relaxed and pretty good. I just, uh, just trying to really be sensitive to the spirit here. Um, I'm just gonna, gonna speak speak a couple things to a couple people. So this is this lady over here with the New York shirt on. I just really I feel like um, uh, oh yeah, I just I got I got this image of, of you uh, in, a, in one of these big white water rafts. On a river, and, and you're, you're having quite a ride, and, but it's good, it's, it's fun, and, and you, I, I, I got a sense you, you don't feel like there's a sense of danger in it, but you're, you're really enjoying the ride. And God's just wanting to bless you in that, and He's wanting to just say, Enjoy the ride, enjoy the ride, enjoy the journey, enjoy the journey in the midst of all of the. the Ways the waves are throwing you around. He's got you. He's got you covered. You're safe. There's angels all around that raft. And it's going to be a good ride. So just enjoy the ride. Enjoy the ride. And uh, this, this fellow over here that I had laid hands on when we were praying, um, I just feel like the Lord is, is, is saying you're like a Joshua and that he is going to be asking you to, to do some things that really don't make any sense to the human mind. Like Joshua, you know, he walked around Jericho and was hoping the walls would crumble. Like, really? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and so I just feel there's, there's, there's like this Joshua call and anointing on you that where you are going to be called to walk and to do some things that other people are going to think are really dumb from a human perspective. You are going to see walls crumble. Walls crumble through the obedience that you have as you walk in obedience to what God has put on your heart. So be blessed with that. <coughs> the last thing we want to focus on, we've talked about, um, what did we talk about? <laughs> uh, we talked about purpose, peace, 
and presence. And the last thing we want to talk about is perspective. How we live every day is determined by what our perspective is. And uh, some of you may have heard me share this before, but I'm just going to quickly share this revelation I had when I started driving bus. Uh, I'm a city bus driver, and I grew up in the country, and I had never been on a city bus until I started driving. And so, uh, uh, ten, ten, years, 10 years before I started driving a bus, I had, within those 10 years, I had two distinct experiences of my memories of interaction with a city bus. And uh, the one was we were on a, on a youth trip. Um, we were uh, like chaperones, kind of a youth group at the time, and went on a youth group trip to Ottawa. And we rented bicycles. That's what you do in Ottawa. Ottawa was a wonderful place to ride a bicycle. Excuse me, and, and so we were riding our bikes, and, and if you're familiar with the city of Ottawa, you know that there's the, on the highways and on the lanes in the city, there's what they have is these diamond lanes. There's a diamond in the lane, which means it's a lane that's meant for taxis and buses, not for cars and bicycles. But I didn't know that. We're biking along, and uh, I'm thinking, oh, the traffic's really busy here, let's just go over in this lane. <laughs> So we're biking along, and all's good there until a bus comes up behind us. And he starts honking his horn, like, get out of my way, you know, kind of a honk. I'm like, what's your problem, buddy, you know? But we got out of the way, and so, so that's interaction number one. Interaction number two is when I was a, a, a truck driver delivering in the city of London. I had to make this delivery in uh, downtown London on the corners of Wellington and Dundas Street to a little hasty market. And uh, there's not a lot of parking for trucks around there, but I pulled up to the stop, uh, to the store, and I'm like, hey, the best place to park is right here in a bus stop. Well, there's no bus here, I'll just park here. And by the time I came back out, there's a bus that's angry with me because I'm in his stop. And I was like, hey, what's the problem, you know? Fast forward to 2001. I get hired by Grand River Transit, and I'm now a bus driver. I am now sitting in the seat of a bus, and I am now experiencing the same feeling that those guys experienced when they honked their horns at me. I'm discovering people that are, are doing things that uh, they're not supposed to do. They're parking in bus stops. They're, um, they're, there's certain areas in the city where only buses can turn right or left. But all of a sudden I realized the world looks different from the seat of a bus. And I realized this, and remember this phrase because it will, it will really, um, it'll just benefit you each and every day. It's this, where you're seated determines your perspective. Where you're seated determines your perspective. When I got seated behind the wheel of a bus, I had a totally different perspective on those situations. So where I'm seated determines my perspective. <clears throat> in Revelation, it tells us that John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And when he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, that's when he got the messages for the seven churches in Asia. And then I think it's after that, chapter 4 I believe, He's told to come up here. Heaven has a different perspective than earth. In Isaiah, he says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher. He says, you say, but I say. He said to me once, um, you know, basically, your, your opinion doesn't matter. He's like, you, you'd better have my opinion. And you better be saying my opinion and agreeing with me and not agreeing with the enemy. We really only have kind of two choices on that. There's the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of darkness. So it's, um, perspective is really important. A friend of mine had a vision uh, back quite a number of years ago and in that vision, um, <coughs> she saw that we were in trenches like in, in the war and she saw, you know, that you'd peek up and look out, and when you did that, you got shot down by the enemy. And that's taking our own 
perception of situations. We need to look higher. The story that I want to tell is from the Old Testament and then how God spoke to me through that. We know the story, or I mean, maybe, maybe we don't all know the story. I'll say the story. How is that? Um, when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they had made their way through the wilderness. It was time to enter the promised land. Moses says, okay, I'm going to send one person from each tribe to spy out the land. You're going to come back and you're going to give a report. So 12 of them went. They spied out the land. They came back. Interesting thing was, the report was basically the same thing. The report was, you know, it's a good land, you know, but there's giants. It's basically the same report. The only thing that was different was the slant that it had. Ten of them said, ho, 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 we're grasshoppers. We were like grasshoppers, they're big, they're big. Two of them said, with God we can do it, we can take the land. But what is in your heart will determine what you align to. And fear went out in the whole camp. And they're like, we're not going in there. There's giants. We're going to get slaughtered. There's giants. We said, no way, we're not going. And God said, okay, then you're not going. There's a verse in Deuteronomy that says, if you, if you can see it, you can have it. The opposite of that is, if you don't see it, you can't have it. God's given us a lot of promises, but it, whether they're fulfilled will depend on how you view it. Really important to agree with what the Lord says. And to change our perspective if we're not in agreement. So that's the first part of the story. Second part is 38 years later, to come back to the same place. They'd have been in the wilderness maybe about two years and God wanted to bring them in the land. So now they're in for about a total of 40 years till it's time to enter, till that whole generation of unbelievers who were God's people, died, died in the wilderness. So now the children of those unbelieving children of God get back to the gateway to get back into the promised land. Two men Two men. Two spies who spied the land and said, we can do it. We can take those giants. They're still there. Joshua now is taking over from Moses. He's leading. And Caleb had a promise from, from Moses who said, that very land that you saw, that you, that you spied out, that's going to be your inheritance. <laughs> So it's time to enter the land. They enter the land and Caleb says to Joshua, Moses made me a promise and I want to take my mountain. And he said, go do it. He's like, I'm 85 now, but I'm strong. I'm as strong as I was 40 years ago. That's a word for, you know, as we age, we still have strength in the Lord. We can still take our giants. We don't have to back down. So 
So I was, I was, um, I don't know, this was maybe about three years ago. I, there was a lot stirring in my spirit about Caleb. And, um, and what was stirring in my heart was, it was, and it's in there, it's like, now Caleb had a, a spirit of excellence. He had an excellent spirit. And so I thought, i got to read about Caleb. Like, I was just stirring. So I read the story, you know, that he went in. It was Hebron. That was his inheritance. And he had to go in and fight there, and there was three giants there. And it says their names. We won't go into that. But where it interfaces with me is the Lord said to me, now what are your giants? What are your three giants? And I knew immediately what two of them were. It just came out of me, well, fear and lack. Those are my giants. I was like, what's the third one? And I started um, just sort of saying stuff. Like, I don't remember what it all was, but all of a sudden it just really hit me as I was just kind of rehearsing some thoughts. Oh, it's the big one, unbelief. Fear, lack, and unbelief. Those were the giants that want to keep me from my inheritance. I, I'd encourage you to ask the Lord, what are yours? Maybe we'll take some time to do that too. But how do we fight the giants? We don't want to partner with those spirits. How, do, how does that, those spirits affect us? <coughs> well, fear wants you just to partner with it. I'm scared. I don't, I'm not going to do that. Look at what's going to happen if I do that. We don't want to partner with that. We want to partner with the Lord. We want to believe what he says and we want to do. What he says, it's about obedience. So I just, I'm just going to lead us through a little exercise here. I just want us to quiet ourselves and just ask the Lord, what are my giants? To just, um, you know, and if you haven't got anything right now, that's okay. You can go home and ask the Lord too. But for those of you who the Lord spoke to you about it, I'm just going to lead you through a prayer of repentance. Father, <coughs> I confess that I've partnered with the enemy in the way I think. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to be that. I don't, I, I want to do as you would have me do. And I break my agreement with whatever the giant is. I break my agreement. I thank you for your blood, Jesus. I thank you for the cross. And as Joshua said, I choose this day to serve you, Lord. And I ask that you would open my eyes to see from your perspective. That I would slay my enemy. Now we're talking about the spiritual giants here. And I would receive your promises. So Father, I just pray over this people. Father, I pray that you would 
bring promises back to life that have seemed to be seemed to have died. And give us the strength and the courage to rise up and fight for our inheritance. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just pray that, that we would rise up today to truly prosper in today. Father, that we can be free from the past with great hope for the future, but living fully in today. Prospering, a prospering for each day to enjoy each day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. It's not just a pretty song that we've gotten used to singing, but it is a powerful declaration. I wake up every morning and, 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 and pray, Thank you, God, for today. Thank you for the blessing of another day in which to live for you. Thank you. Thank you. Just release that over.